Hello, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm defining introverted sensing. So introverted sensing is the dominant cognitive function for ISFJs and ISTJs, and it's the secondary cognitive function for ESFJs and ESTJs. Um, if you don't know what a cognitive function is, I will have a card linked above for what cognitive functions are. You'll definitely need to know that for this video. Cognitive functions make Myers-Briggs so much more interesting in my opinion, and there's a whole other world to dive into if you just know about the four letter dichotomy. So definitely check that out. You'll need to know it for this video. So the way this video is gonna work is I'm gonna start by defining and taking quotes from kind of the main players who define these things, who coined these things themselves. So I'm going to start with Carl Jung in his 1921 book Psychological Types, then I'll take quotes from Vanderhoop in his 1937 book Conscious Orientation, and then I'll take quotes from Myers and Briggs in their 1980 book Gifts Differing, and they were working on it as early as 1942, so that's why I put that time window there. So based on their quotes and keywords and key themes that I see over and over and over again, we're kind of kind of define it, pull all those keywords together in one slide and those key themes together. And then I want to get into kind of caricatured vibes. If I play up the stereotypes and really amplify these things, what could this visually look like in America in 2023 in a picture in kind of a caricature and as a stereotype? So let's get into Carl Jung. Sensation, which in obedience to its whole nature is concerned with the object and the objective stimulus, also undergoes a considerable modification in the introverted attitude. It too has a subjective factor. For beside the object sensed, there stands a sensing object who contributes his subjective disposition to the objective stimulus. So there's these, the words, particularly with the perceiving functions, the words objective and subjective are going to come up a lot. And objective is talking about external. It doesn't mean in this context of personality, it doesn't mean like objective as in unbiased. It just means like external and subjective, meaning kind of internal in your own kind of interpretation. So it's not just that you see a picture and you say, oh, look, there's a tree in that picture. You know, it's not just that, but it's looking at it and having a subjective disposition and a subjective interpretation to it. So when you look at a picture, maybe something really stands out to you, like, oh, that was uh, the place where so-and-so got married. And that's not said anywhere in the picture. That's not objectively in the picture, but it's something that you go back in and you pull out something that's important to you. A true sense perception certainly exists, but it always looks as though objects were not so much forcing their way into the subject in their own right, as if the subject were seeing things quite differently or saw quite other things than the rest of mankind. As a matter of fact, the subject perceives the same things as everybody else, only he never stops at the purely objective effect, but concerns himself with the subjective perception released by the objective stimulus. So it's saying, this is more just reiterating the same thing. When you see something, it's not just stopping at what's objectively there. Like if you look at a magnet, you might say, oh look, this is a blue magnet. That's kind of the objective thing that maybe an extroverted sensor might do. But an introverted sensor sees things quite differently and subjectively in their own light. So they might say, this is the magnet that I got at Disneyland. Now you can't, you can't know that by looking at the magnet, but it's kind of the subjective interpretation and the experience with that object. It sees things somewhat as a million year old consciousness might see them. Such a consciousness would see the becoming and the passing of things beside their present and momentary existence. And not only that, but at the same time, it would also see that other, which was before their becoming and will be after their passing hence. So this starts a big theme with introverted sensing of time, a million year old consciousness, which would see the becoming and the passing of things, not just their present and momentary existence, but also what they're becoming and what they will be passing hence. There becomes a theme with this million year old consciousness, seeing things from an older perspective, from a timeless perspective, long lasting value. Introverted sensation conveys an image whose effect is not so much to reproduce the object as to throw over it a wrapping whose luster is derived from age old subjective experience and the still unborn future event. Thus, mere sense impression develops into the depth of the meaningful, while extroverted sensation seizes only the momentary and manifest existence of things. So this is really contrasting introverted sensing from extroverted sensing. So extroverted sensing seizing the momentary present existence of things. Whereas introverted sensing puts a luster over it. It's not just seeing the object, but it puts an age old luster over it and experiences as you might from an old perspective or a still unborn future event, there's a very, there's a toggling between past and future with introverted sensing. And there's definitely an emphasis on the age old or a million year old consciousness. There's definitely a playing with the future at times. There's definitely more of an emphasis on the past, but they do 
pull in the future, the still unborn future event. And it says the impression develops into the depth of the meaningful. Or it's not just, this is a picture of so-and-so and so-and-so, and so, but it develops into the meaningful and it's making meaning from the object or making meaning from the experiences. Whereas the extroverted sensation type is determined by the intensity of the objective influence, the introverted type is orientated by the intensity of the subjective sensation constituent released by the objective stimulus. So extroverted sensing might be interested in a very loud noise. It's an intense sensation. Introverted sensing is not interested in intense momentary sensation but they're interested in whatever is released in them, whatever meaning is released in them by the object. So they see some object and it releases some meaning. So they see a magnet for, just as an example, maybe you see a magnet and you're like, oh, this is where we got this at Disney and at that shop, da, da, da. And there's all this age old meaning that gets created. And they'll talk about how it appears very subjective. Two people might look at the same object and their subjective interpretation is very different and it's kind of, it's kind of a fun thing, like you never know what they're gonna pull out from this object or what subjective meaning they're pulling out from it. He may actually stand out by the very calmness and passivity of his demeanor or by his rational self-control. So this definitely starts a theme. There'll be many quotes about calmness, passi passivity, and irrational self-control. Considered from without, it looks as though the effect of the object did not obtrude itself upon the subject. This intervention may be so abrupt that the individual appears to shield himself directly from any possible influence of the object. In any aggravated or well-marked case, such a protective guard is also actually present. This will become a theme, this quote a little more indirectly than some quotes later will directly say this, but there becomes a theme of this protective guard or this shield from the external world. And not liking the, there will be some quotes later on about not liking the intense uh, not like in the intense external world. You know, they have this calm demeanor, and I think they like that. And the intense external world seems like it's intruding upon them. And so they kind of put up a shield, and they don't want so much this intense sensory experience as the meaning they can make from their experience. I can think of an example of this. It seems like sometimes people of this type don't like going to Disneyland as much as talking about going to Disneyland. Uh, I'm just picking Disneyland as an arbitrary example, but it's like when you're at Disneyland, all the sensory is just intruding upon you and there's all this what could happen. There'll be some quotes about the dangerous what ifs in a moment. Uh, but then when you look at it after the fact and you're looking at it as a picture, just an object, it's a calm object that's not intruding upon you, then you can go into your preferred state, which is to make meaning from that and think about all the, all the meaning that you made from those experiences and which, and which of the experiences you subjectively found meaning in. The too low is raised a little, the too high is made a little lower. The enthusiastic is damped, the extravagant restrained, and the unusual brought within the correct formula. All this in order to keep the influence of the object within the necessary bounds. So this is more of this, the external is kind of intrusive. So, you know, we got it not too loud, not too quiet, not too enthusiastic. Now with extroverted sensing, there was lots about strong sensations, but no, enthusiastic, we're gonna damp down. Extravagant, we're gonna strain in, the, in regard to the sensory world. Anything unusual, we're gonna bring it in the correct formula. And we're going to keep things within the necessary bounds so that we can stay within our preferred mode of operation, which is kind of making meaning from experiences and not, you know, being overwhelmed by the sensory experiences. Relatively speaking, this type has only archaic possibilities of expression for the disposal of his impressions. Thought and feeling are relatively unconscious, and insofar as they have a certain consciousness, they only serve in the necessary, banal, everyday expressions. So this word archaic will come up a lot, and I looked up the definition of archaic because I have kind of a negative connotation with the word archaic, but actually the definition of it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation. It just means having an old-fashioned flavor. So relatively speaking, this type likes this old-fashioned flavor for possibilities of expression. Above all, his development estranges him from the reality of the object, handing him over to his subjective perceptions, which orientate his consciousness in accordance with an archaic reality, although his deficiency in comparative judgment keeps him wholly unaware of this fact. So once again, kind of wanting to be estranged from the actual sensory environment of what's happening to go in and make meaning. And they like to make meaning in accordance with an archaic or old-fashioned reality. 
And it says they might not be aware that they're making meaning in this way. As a rule, the individual acquiesces in his isolation and in the banality of the reality, which however he unconsciously treats archaically. So once again, we have this word archaically, it comes up many, many times. But once again, we're seeing banality, so very commonplace, and we're also seeing isolation, which kind of comes back to this reserved nature of introverted sensing. Whereas true extroverted intuition has a characteristic resourcefulness and a good nose for every possibility in objective reality, this archaic, old-fashioned extroverted intuition that the introverted sensor has, has an amazing flair for every ambiguous, gloomy, dirty, and dangerous possibility in the background of reality. So it's talking about like, if extroverted intuition is used as a strength, it's optimistically seeking possibilities. But when you're an introverted sensor and you have extroverted intuition forth, let's say, it's not looking for these optimistic possibilities, it's looking for these dangerous possibilities and you know, we go back to that quote of putting up the protective guard or the protective shield because there are lots of dangerous, dirty, ambiguous possibilities to be on the lookout for. Okay, so now I wanna move on to Vanderhoop. The attention of the introvert is not directed primarily to the source sensation as communicated to him through his sense organs, but to its so-called feeling tone and to his own impulses. It depends upon the extent to which he is stirred, whether a given experience will make a big impression on him, not upon the intensity of the sensation itself. They're not so much interested in what are they directly seeing, what are they directly hearing, or it, it's not like the louder the noise, the more impression it makes necessarily. There could be very commonplace things that will stir them. And it's a very subjective stirring. There's kind of a feeling tone to these things where something will happen and you know, it's hard for an observer to say what is going to stir up this feeling tone, this sentimentality sometimes. And then after the fact, years later, I'll hear introverted sensors, they'll tell me a story and I'm so surprised at which stories they remember. And it's things I don't even remember and I'm very surprised and they can be very commonplace. Like as it says, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big experience to make a big impression. It can be just, you know, a casual statement that someone makes in a very everyday common occurrence and that will mark them and stir them. Inherited disposition and early experience have produced a certain susceptibility to impressions and a certain need for emotional experience. And in these cases, the whole mental life is directed by these two factors. I find that they speak a lot about inherited disposition and early experience. This is something that I hear introverted sensors talk a lot about, like inherited, uh, inheritance in general, talking about, um, I got this from my dad, or I got this from there. And I hear that type of thing a lot, hearkening back to the past. Um, and they'll also talk about early experiences marking them. I hear them talking a lot about, you know, telling stories about their early relationships with their siblings or with their parents. Um, I definitely hear a lot about past uh, experiences for sure. Now we can add the children of this type. Very, I found this section always to be so fascinating. Children of this type are frequently noted for a certain gentleness and receptiveness, but also for periods of timidity and monosyllabic reserve. So this is interesting. I, as a teacher, so I've taught as young, I've predominantly taught like upper, like, 15 is predominantly the grade that I've taught the most. And it's, it was so interesting to watch the introverted sensors. I definitely do sense they're very receptive, very gentle. I do sense some of this timidity. Very, very good students. Like if I, if I ever, you know, if I'm like model student, it's usually the ISJs. Very, um, very easy to teach. They are attached to people in their environment who are kind to them. They love nature, animals, beautiful things, and an environment with which they have become familiar. Anything strange or new has at first no attraction for them, but they offer little active resistance to it and soon learn to accept the good in it. So this is very interesting. This is still continuing on about children of this type. They get attached to these familiar things, maybe familiar people or a familiar environment. When older too, these people usually give an outward impression of being reserved, quiet, and somewhat passive. So once again, we're definitely continuing on on this theme of reserved, quiet, somewhat passive. People of this type have well-developed sense organs, but they are particularly receptive to anything having lasting value for human instinctual needs. This lends to their lives a certain solid comfort, although it may lead to somewhat ponderous caution if instinct becomes too deeply attached to all kinds of minor details. This lots to unpack in here. There are many key things about introverted sensing in this whole area. So the first part talking about well-developed sense organs. So I find that they are very fine tuned into details when it comes to sensory things. For example, I was talking to an ISFJ and she was talking about different brands of contacts that she was wearing. And she rattled through all the different brands of contacts that she's, that she's tried and what's the best for the price and all these different things. And she went probably 10 brands of contacts or whatever. And she's like, and I still haven't found any that are quite clear and don't go blurry on me because I have astigmatism. 
And she named a brand that I wear. I personally wear this brand of contacts. And I had never noticed that they go blurry until she said it. And now I can't really unnotice it, but they do go blurry from time to time. And I'm like, I guess I, you know. So yeah, anyways, well-developed sense organs. Um, They're particularly receptive to anything having lasting value for human instinctual needs. I definitely find that you'll definitely hear introverted sensors say things like, um, they don't make things like they used to, or like the quality of things has gone down. Um, definitely not so much interested in trends, momentary fleeting things, but things that are tried and true with having lasting value. Although it may lead to a somewhat ponderous caution. This is definitely, this is continuing the theme of caution, shielding themselves from the environment. Um, and then instinct can become attached to all kinds of minor details. So very, very detail oriented. Many, many key things within this paragraph about introverted sensing. His tendency to carry on everything down to the smallest detail in the same old way. I kind of, you know, truncated this because the stuff beforehand is just more of the same, but very routined, you know, the same old way. There's still this emphasis on old. There's still this emphasis on details and, you know, carrying on with the routine. He also shows a passive resistance to anything new, which can only be overcome by absolutely convincing experience. Um, this is true. I find that, I think this passive has come up many times, um, passive resistance to anything new. You know, they be, have become accustomed to things which are familiar, and I think they, they attach meaning to things. So it's not just like, this is the way we do things, this way we do things, but they kind of attached a feeling to it, attached to like a, I really like this and uh, their subjective interpretation to it. So I think letting go of something that you've uh, become attached to, you know, it would be difficult. Um, this is me splicing together a bunch of different quotes, but they were, they talked about they could be a farmer who continues on doing the same thing every day. They could be a sailor who does the same thing in the same old way. Um, a naturalist, a lonely collector of beautiful or interesting things. The painter who manages to express a deep experience in the presentation of ordinary things. So there's a couple things to unpack here. When they mentioned like the farmer, the sailor, and the naturalist, what they were keying in on is, you know, you're doing the same thing the same way for a long amount of time and then getting really skilled at it. One thing I think is interesting is this lonely collector of beautiful or interesting things. I find that they tend to collect things like if they go on a trip, um, maybe they get a magnet for every state that they've been to. And then they attach kind of a meaning to that magnet. So then every time that they see it, it kind of attaches more memories to it, uh, more significance to that experience. And then a painter who presents ordinary things. So we're continuing this theme of banal or commonplace, but meaning in ordinary everyday things, not just seeing things as ordinary, but there's kind of a special aspect or an enhancement of ordinary things. In their own field, these people are usually very much at home, having a good mastery of the technical side of their calling. I think it's just true. They get so good at what they're doing. I've known some teachers who, you know, they've been teaching for 30 years and they're so good at what they do. They really just get in the groove. These are really people who um, are most alive, it seems, the longer they've been doing something and they get so skilled at doing it. They accept both what they can and what they cannot do as simple facts, but they tend on the whole to underestimate rather than to overestimate themselves. Pretense and bluff in others may irritate them to the point of protest, which is probably connected with their own difficulty in understanding their own potentialities and worth. Yeah, this is kind of coming back to when they said that extroverted intuition is fourth, and instead of seeing optimistic possibilities, it's really only looking at the pessimistic possibilities. And I think that that, you know, part of possibilities is also with yourself and your own worth and what's your potential. And it's kind of, you know, underestimate, there's a very down to earth quality about introverted sensors, but part of that down to earth quality is not really seeing their own possibilities and what they could do, um, which I think is kind of sad. I do notice pretense and bluff does irritate them. I don't find, you know, like it says, they are, they tend to be reserved and thinking of ISJs in particular, but pretense and bluff does seem to really irritate them. These people usually strike one as very quiet and somewhat passive, except in relation to persons and things in their own immediate sphere to which they are bound by their instinctual reactions. They show little inclination to activity. They never readily depart from their routine. So yeah, more about this quiet and passive. And this begins this theme of their immediate sphere. It's kind of, it's, there becomes a theme of kind of this protective bubble of the home. There's immediate sphere. There's like these immediate people who are led into the sphere and in your home. But for the most part, you know, you're gonna be struck as kind of quiet and passive. Uh, they show little inclination to activity. This is, I find that like people are playing yard games or something like, 
if we're playing spike ball, let's say, I find that SI users kind of are not super inclined to play unless maybe it's something they've been doing for a while or it's a sport they've played for a while or something, you know, familiar. But I find that like, you know, spike ball is a relatively newer game. So I find that they're not that inclined to join. Uh, they never readily depart from their routine. So this is more continuing that routine, the familiar. They feel extraordinarily helpless and inferior. This was, uh, this quote really struck me. I don't know if this is, I don't know this is true for probably all SI users, but this ponderous caution that it continues to talk about, I'm like, I wonder, they probably do feel so helpless. You know, that caution doesn't come from nowhere. So I found this, I, I found this interesting. I think this is maybe a little exaggerated and there are certainly other functions that would compensate for this, but maybe introverted sensing in itself feels somewhat helpless. Observations and ideas are matter of fact and clear. They prefer to stick to the familiar and find it difficult to adopt anything new. This is connected with their need to see things in a clear setting. In more abstract matters, they find it difficult to form an opinion of their own and follow those authorities which, by knowledge of the facts, give them the impression of being thorough. Even so, they do not feel any confidence and are easily upset if drawn into discussion in this field or if the value of their authorities is questioned. On the other hand, they have few prejudices and their view of things is calm and temperate. So kind of a lot to unpack here. Well, this is kind of one of the first we're talking about matter of fact and clear. I think they've said detail oriented already in these quotes, but clear and matter of fact, I find their communication to be very clear, very uh, few miscommunications with SI users, I find. Uh, again, preferring to stick to the familiar. It appears something unalterable and the feelings which arise therefrom are also experienced as something unavoidable and are accepted with certain fatalism. The attitude is I was born that way and I cannot change my nature. So it's almost like, I think I've perceived introverted sensing for a long time as just not liking change. But this actually kind of first starts a theme of a, be a belief that change is not possible or a belief um, in fatalism. People don't change, however you were born, kind of referencing this age old past, however you were born is how you will be. And I actually, um, with, there's an introverted sensor I'm thinking of who I never really get into abstract conversations with, but actually she will get into conversations about fatalism, it's very interesting. Feelings are therefore specially developed within a personal sphere to which the individual is attached and which reminds him of home. Within such a sphere, these people may occasionally be able to emanate a certain warmth and coziness around themselves. So yeah, I definitely find that with introverted sensors, you really want to get into that personal sphere that they have because that's where you see their, individu their individuated nature. Um, and they like things that remind them of home, I found. Whatever home means to them and whatever specifically they've keyed in on that home means. Masculinity and femininity are accordingly strongly emphasized in the emotional life of such people. I definitely find that for many um, SI users, they definitely fall strongly into um, what they perceive to be masculine and feminine. Whatever they've keyed on are the important things within those roles. Intuitive views, for example, of religion and politics are accepted by him provided they appear in traditional form. The somewhat passive attitude towards life of these people then exerts an influence in that factors of predestination and fate are likely to play a large part in their philosophy. This has been a theme for all the functions. Like for example, for extroverted sensors, it says intuitive views are accepted provided that they make the sensory environment more stimulating. So in this case, intuitive views are accepted provided that they continue on with the traditional and old fashioned ways. So it's kind of like they will use these things that they're not too fond of, the intuition in this case, they'll use those things if it will be subordinate to what they are fond of, which is kind of these traditional ways. Okay, now let's get into Myers and Briggs. Values the subjective impression released by the object rather than the object itself, for which the individual may hardly be aware. So yeah, more again, it's not just it, the picture frame, we're not just liking the picture frame, but it's whatever is released from seeing that picture, whatever subjective interpretation is released from seeing it. Sees things highly colored by the subjective factor, the impression being merely suggested by the object and coming out of the unconscious in the form of some meaning or significance. So once again, like maybe you'll see this picture frame and the picture frame is at, the pictures that you have at Disneyland. And so it suggests you're at Disneyland. But what comes out of that, the meaning that comes out of it is something, you know, a few hops away perhaps from Disneyland. You know, this reminded you of this, reminded you of this, and you know, you're now hopped over to whatever you found meaningful or significant. 
And to the other, you know, the other person, it's like, wait, where did that come from? I can't, I'm so surprised that you pulled that out of seeing this picture. Develops an extremely eccentric and individual inner self, which sees things other people do not see. It's, you know, it's comparing and contrasting the past from the present and how have things changed and how are, th how are the timelines going? And, you know, there's all this meaning that they see that other people are not seeing. And that meaning comes from the sensory object, or at least it started from it. The meaning's pulled out of the sensory object. Are systematic, painstaking, and thorough. So we're getting back to more detail-oriented. Carry responsibility especially well. And I think when you think about these other traits that they've already mentioned, being detail-oriented and thorough, that makes you responsible. Um, when you're cautious, that makes that makes you responsible. You know, you're not gonna do anything risky. Or if you um, continue on with like a tried and true method that's worked for a long time, then, you know, that's very responsible. There's not a lot of risk involved there. So yeah, definitely you carry responsibility well. Are outwardly matter of fact, inwardly entertained by extremely individual relations to their sense impressions. I do find that there is within them, there is this extremely individual side to them. You know, outwardly, we're going to get this reserve. But if you are let into that bubble, I think introverted sensors are one of the types where this bubble becomes most evident. When you're let into that bubble, you become privy to this whole other world that other people are not privy to, as far as goofiness and this very individual side. And I can only imagine what inwardly it must be like. Absorb and enjoy using an immense number of facts. I find that they're very good at trivia games, even if they profess to not be very good because, you know, the standard is like perfection for <laughs> SI users, but they are better than like everyone in the room. So they don't think they're very good, but they're better than like everyone in the room. Very good with trivia, spe specifically trivia of the past. They lend stability to everything with which they are connected. I think stability is another key word. You know, that is some, that's a really big strength of theirs, especially when you're not, you know, constantly changing or being blown about by this trend and this trend. It makes you very, there's definitely a stability where you feel like you can lean on them. Their use of experience contributes to their stability. They habitually compare present and past situations. I do find that I see that the word habitually, that's definitely a very SI word combining with routine and comparing past and present. It's always making meaning. Okay, the past was like this and the present's like this and how has it changed? And, you know, how, and then there's hints of, so where are things going? But so it's building on based on the past and how things are in the present, building hints of like building this future thing. And you know, what's the timeless thing? What, you know, what are the things that are really la of lasting value? They like everything kept factual and stated clearly and simply. Okay, so now I wanna get into the themes. Look at how big this chunk is. Time was by far stated in many different ways, the biggest theme with introverted sensing. I copied and pasted tons of these quotes. So we've got million year old consciousness, see the becoming and the passing of things beside their present momentary existence, the becoming and the passing of things, would see the other which was before their becoming and will be after their passing hence. Throw over it a wrapping whose luster is derived from age old subjective experience and the still unborn future event, archaic old fashioned possibilities, archaic reality, unconsciously treats reality archaically, early experiences influence, receptive to anything having lasting value for humans' instinctual needs. Instinctual, uh, when Vander Hoof means sensory needs. So lasting value for sensory needs. Habitually compare past and present situations. So, so much about the past in particular. There are hints of the future. There's hints of the present, like comparing the past and present. But m the vast majority of these words are talking about the time past and what's going to be timeless. Subjective. This was definitely something, it's an, a subjective with sensory things. Like, it's not just, this is a calculator. But this is, this is a calculator that I got at my first teaching job where I met so-and-so. So, it's, anyways, it's a subjective orientation. It's not just like, this is a blue calculator with white buttons. It's not so, uh, just objective, you know, it's a... There's something subjective released from the object, oh, like a nostalgia, and it's a, a subjective nostalgia. What is gonna key in on things? Seeing things quite differently, concerns himself with subjective perception, mere sense impression develops into the depth of the meaningful, a given experience will make a big impression on him if it stirs him, sees things highly colored by the subjective factor, develops eccentric and individual inner self. So it's all about this very subjective meaning, and you, it's hard to say from the outside what's going to stir him, what's going to make the impression, what is specifically going to color this external that we're engaging with. A uh, calm, there was definitely a sense of calm or reserve. Stand out by the very calmness and passivity of his demeanor or by his rational self-control. The enthusiastic is damped, the extravagant restrained, 
acquiesces in his isolation, gentleness and receptiveness, reserve, quiet, somewhat passive, reserved again, strike one is quiet and passive, calm and temperate. So there's definitely from this external, especially when you're outside the personal sphere, a very calm self-control. And passive was mentioned quite a lot. Passive was quite a common word. A shield, I didn't know exactly how to say this, but there's there was definitely a theme of caution and caution with the sensory world in particular. Uh, so the object did not obtrude itself upon the subject. So like if objects are kind of intrusive. Uh, individual appears to shield himself directly. A protective guard is also actually present. Keep within the necessary bounds. Has an amazing flair for every ambiguous, gloomy, dirty, and dangerous possibility. Timidity, ponderous caution, feel extraordinarily helpless and inferior. So there's definitely a theme with the sensory world that we don't want all of this too much sensory to get in the way of the meaning that we're making. And it seems that this calm environment is where the, these meanings are able to be made. A routine, necessary banal everyday expressions, acquiesces in the banality of the reality, in the same old way, never readily depart from their routine, a certain solid comfort. Within their personal sphere, they can emanate warmth and coziness. So there was definitely this routine and we keep on doing it. It keeps us, it keeps a stability to the life. It is very grounding. A familiar, definitely liking familiar things. Love an environment with which they have become familiar. Anything strange or new has at first no attraction for them. Passive resistance to anything new. Passive except in immediate sphere. They prefer to stick to the familiar and find it difficult to adopt anything new. Fatalism. I was born that way and I cannot change. Predestination. Fate. Appear in traditional form. Lend stability. So definitely liking the familiar... Uh, nervous about anything new. And last one's details. Attached to all kinds of minor details, down to the smallest detail, good mastery of the technical side of their calling, are systematic, painstaking, and thorough, like everything kept factual and stated clearly and simply. So there's a, a precision with details, good with the technical side, good with minor details, definitely de detail oriented. Okay, so now I wanna get into one slide about introverted sensing. So I'll remove my face in a second, but if you wanna screenshot this, I'm making a slide for each of the cognitive functions. So if I was showing a beginner, you could just kind of compare these eight slides to each other and you can kind of see the differences. So some words go routine, calm, traditional, cozy, caution, old fashioned, habitually, gentle, stability, age-old experience, recalling, temperate, thorough, painstaking, responsibility, reserve, lasting value, timid, subjective memory, detail-oriented, loyal, passive, stories, history, compare past and present, comfort, familiar, protective guard, and consistent. So I think that when you combine kind of all this, I was taking those themes, uh, synonyms from words that were used, words that were directly used, and kind of combining this all on one slide. Um, I chose this picture because it talks about kind of as children, how receptive they are. This is a very calm looking child. This is someone, you know, I imagine maybe they're opening a history book and they're kind of making their own meaning from it. But in school, traditionally at least, school is a very calm environment. And so doing really well in a calm environment, maybe we're listening to stories from the teacher, maybe looking, you know, detail oriented. I think that's a skill which does well in school. Um, it's a familiar environment as well. So I thought, you know, kind of a quiet student listening kind of did well to kind of show introverted sensing. Okay, so now we have introverted sensing as a caricature. And these slides, they're always so difficult to make, you know, because people are so individual and it depends on your experiences. I find with introverted sensors, they are formed so much and marked by their experiences that it creates a lot of individuality with, within them that can be difficult sometimes to pinpoint these things. Um, especially introverted functions in general. How do you show externally an individual function? Someone going in and making meaning from their experiences. How do you show that? So that can be kind of difficult to show. Um, but I wanted to start by just mentioning in general kind of this color palette. So besides the safety things at the bottom, like you look at the Anne of Green Gables, you got this light green, you got some of these browns, very calming colors. And I wanted to make mention of kind of this, it it's, looks kind of calming besides this whole safety section at the bottom. So in the top left, we have two people hiking. I find that they're not necessarily the type of people who are so um, like avid hikers or, you know, n like that, or like uh, rugged and risky hikes, like not that type of thing, but in a very calm way. You go out with friends and you kind of leisurely in a very calm way go hiking. Uh, the clothes that they're wearing are kind of uh, traditional. They're not 
particularly trendy. They're not, it's not a fleeting thing. This is a relatively timeless type thing, t-shirt and shorts. They're wearing good quality shoes. Like when I talk about caution from the external environment, um, they make sure to have like good protective shoes. I find like maybe good for arch support or that type of thing. Um, you know, cautious about anything that could go wrong. So making sure they've got good quality shoes, um, making sure they bring enough water and that type of thing. Uh, the next person, I've got this guy riding a horse. This whole color palette is looking very SI to me. It's very calming, these browns, uh, wearing this plaid shirt and jeans. That's very, uh, it's very traditional. That's not, it's not trendy, but it's somewhat timeless. I think a plaid shirt is going to be something that is wearable for a long time. Um, but it's not necessarily trendy. And it said that they love animals and they love nature was something that they mentioned. Um, and riding horses, that's kind of a traditional thing. You know, it used to be the traditional mode of transportation. And so it's kind of leaning on traditional things. It's not, it's not modern necessarily to ride horses, but you know, and especially if they grew up riding horses, I find that they really liked it. Um, but you know, maybe they didn't grow up in that environment. And so of course this is just like a caricature. Uh, the next one, I've got someone taking a picture. I find that, you know, this looks kind of like professional, but even I find that they take a lot of pictures because that picture will release a meaning for them in a subjective way, whatever that means for them. It kind of takes them into the experience and it releases, it takes them into that experience and it releases like their history and the subjective meaning that they made in it. I heard one essay user talking about he's trying to take more pictures because he finds that it expands his capacity for memory. Like he won't remember something, but he'll look at a picture and then he remembers it. And then because he remembers that, it releases all these other things. And so he really wants to remember things tangibly. Uh, next, I've got two movies. I've got Pearl Harbor and Saving Private Ryan. Um, you know, I mentioned like Pearl Harbor because it's based on a historical event. And I find that history is something that introverted censors are really interested in. And I find that introverted censors especially like we look back to history so that we can learn in the future and kind of this, how the past will inform the present and these universal things that humans will do. And, you know, humans haven't really changed all that much. We're still doing all the same type of things. And just kind of, this kind of idea of timeless, uh, timeless archetypes that, that haven't gone away. Um, so I find that they like that type of thing. Oh, we got Anne of Green Gables. Very, that's a very traditional type thing. This color palette's very SI to me. It's very calming colors. Um, very traditional. This is really caricaturing. Um, books that have been around for a long time that have very detail-oriented writing. I find that they really like when people really deeply go into the exposition and what the scenery looks like and really getting into the sens intricate sensory details. I find that they really like that type of writing. Um, on the far left, I've got magnets. So I just find that, like I said, like a lonely collector of things. And I do find that it will take tokens of things and collect things like images, like pictures. Pictures will release experiences, but in the same way, magnets, if you went on a trip, they will release things. And it doesn't take up a lot of space, but it's something that kind of will release those experiences. Um, in the bottom left, I got this person looks like they're a teacher. This person's wearing overalls. That's something that's kind of traditional. Um, I think introverted sensors do very well in school. So I kind of put this as a teacher, you know, they go back in school. When I, you know, when I was a teacher, I had a lot of coworkers who were introverted sensors. Um, and they've really shaped the way that school is and they've shaped it in the way that they have liked school to be. Of uh, the next few images, I have a lot of different safety things. So we have hand sanitizer, sunscreen, life jackets, and helmets. And it's said that introverted sensors are kind of cautious with the sensory environment. And so these are some ways that they kind of put up their protective shield, as it said. So, you know, it depends on what strikes the introverted sensor in particular, but usually, you know, if I go on hikes with introverted sensors, they're like, oh, do you want sunscreen? I never bring sunscreen, but they usually, Usually the introverted sensors will have sunscreen. They offer me some. Or, you know, I've been on a lot of public transportation now living in San Francisco. So I find the introverted sensors here will have uh, hand sanitizer. Hey, you want some hand sanitizer? Or uh, even when I was younger, like if I went to a carnival, introverted sensors, like, oh, you want some sunscreen? <laughs> hand sanitizer? Uh, life jackets, helmets. Uh, my mom is a dominant introverted sensor. She sent me a meme one time, which I tried to find, but it was like, <laughs> it was this person who wearing like, elbow pads for skateboarding and a helmet and floaties for swimming and a life jacket. And she was just kind of <laughs> poking fun at herself. She's like, is this enough safety equipment? Uh, so just a very safety conscious. Uh, then I have a picture of Roy Gilmore from Gilmore Girls. Um, you know, with movie characters, they act kind of inconsistently. So it's very difficult to type them. At times she seems like an ISFJ. At times she seems like an ISTJ. Um, either way, I definitely get strong introverted sensing vibes from her. If you look at the way she dresses, that's what I mostly wanted to point out. Her hair is very reserved. This is something that's kind of timeless. 
Um, it's not trendy hairstyle, it's a natural hairstyle. It's very minimal makeup. These clothes, these clothes look very put together. These clothes look very responsible. These clothes look calm. And these clothes, they're not trendy. None of these clothes are trendy. You know, the show came out a long time ago and a lot of these pieces are wearable now because they're not uh, into trends so much. But whereas if you look at the way Lorelai dresses, her stuff is a little more obviously of the time period that Gilmore Girls came out. But um, Rory dresses very just responsibly calm it doesn't stand out in any one particular way or another um very calming colors you know you've got these jewel tones kind of calming or you could take this like green pastels kind of calming so i do see that type of thing a lot and on the bottom right i just put i've seen a lot of isjs wear these shoes on the right these flats um i think it's because they want to dress responsibly it seems these shoes also have good like arch support so it's i find that they're particular about that type of thing they have a tuned sensory organs is what it said so i find that you know if their feet hurt i find that they're going to be aware of it quicker so they want comfortable shoes so i don't find them wearing heels as much as like se users i might see wearing a more bold choice like heels so but if a woman wants to dress up you know she wear flats because they're comfortable and uh, these are very reserved these are not anything particularly trendy or out there they're you know they're pretty timeless so yeah like i said i'm just playing up the stereotypes i'm really just trying to like poke on uh, different patterns that I've seen. And introverted sensing, this is the analogy that I've used in all my videos, but I'll just continue it here in case it's the first video you're seeing. But if introverted sensing metaphorically is like blue paint, um, this could be what I'm trying to describe here is like this full blue paint. But you as an individual, you're not introverted sensing in isolation without any other functions. You are not this full blue paint. You take your introverted sensing and you combine it with extroverted feeling, or maybe you combine it with extroverted thinking, and maybe that represents yellow paint. So you take some of this blue paint, take some of that yellow paint, and you as an individual are a little green, and then you have your other functions, and you know your color changes a little bit. So as I describe blue, it's not gonna fully describe you because you're a mixture of many different functions. And so it creates a different flavor as well as your own past experiences, as you know, where you're from and your upbringing and things like that. So this is just really a caricature, really amplifying things, as well as maybe you're not introverted sensing first, like introverted sensing first, maybe this full blue paint, but then maybe you're an ESJ, so you're introverted sensing second. So you take a little white paint, it kind of waters it down a little bit. So your introverted sensing is more of a light blue introverted sensing. It's not this full blue introverted sensing. So you can kind of, you know, kind of water these things down the further and further introverted sensing gets down your stack to the point where you know it's hardly whispering to things at all so yeah if you are interested i have a link in the description box for all of the personality type playlists so like if you're an istj and you want to know all the videos that i've done about istjs i will have that playlist link below so you can check that out um thank you so much for watching extroverted intuition video is coming next so if you're an introverted sensor you have extroverted intuition so that video is coming next so stay tuned to check that out uh, thanks so much for watching bye